The Tatur has grown into one of the most important non-stop cycle races in the world, and we've got the most participants worldwide. The Tartur consists of two races. One is the Tartur itself, which covers a distance of 1,000 kilometers, 12,500 meters of climbing, and five alpine passes. This year it has also become the host of the Swiss Ultra Cycling Championship. And then there is the Challenge, which covers 560 kilometers at around 6,000 meters of altitude. The Tartur was created for people who are looking for the ultimate kick. It's a thousand kilometers non-stop for the solo riders, the heroes. We've had big names like Ram winner, Jura Rovic, who won this race, Marko Balu, who is also from Slovenia and has raced here. But the exciting thing is that it's not just solo riders who compete, but also teams of two, four, and six. And there, it's all about the team effort and the team spirit. Over the last few years, the Tatur has become really important in our scene, and it is known across the borders of our country and has a very good reputation. No matter if you do it solo or in a team of two or four, if you say that you take part in the Tatur, people know what you are talking about, and they also know that it's a challenge and that it's tough. It's the only non-stop race without sleeping over such a long distance here in Switzerland. It's without breaks, I don't sleep, and just stop to eat a sandwich or a muesli bar, and then it's off again. In the countries I've been racing, like Italy, France, or Austria, the Tatur is a well-known name, and it's got a really high standing among the ultra races. It's one of the best organized races for sure, not the one, but yeah, it's, it's a really important race, it's a great country, you see, you see the whole country in a day and a half if you're fast. This is a race where you don't race against other teams, but against yourself. You have to conquer your weak yourself, and everyone reaches their limits no matter if you race solo or in teams of two, four, or six. And everyone who crosses the finish line is a winner. The Tatur interests me because it's a unique event. There is a great atmosphere amongst the athletes. You push your limits, you have to deal with the unexpected, you are exposed to the weather winds, and you have to react spontaneously to the situations that you face. I've been interested in long distance races for a long time. Challenges where you push the mental and physical side to its limits. And it's a fascination to cycle nonstop all the way around Switzerland. It's my passion, and doing it in a race makes it twice as interesting. One of the interesting aspects of ultra cycling is pushing your own limits. It's a different way of pushing than a stage race, where the moment is over quickly and where things can happen in seconds. It's about the joy of cycling. It's the challenge of cycling around Switzerland on your bike, and it's the challenge of sounding out your limits. That's the attraction of it all. Europe's biggest waterfall, the iconic Rheinfall in Schaffhausen, was the host location for the prologue, a time trial in which the Tortor competitors were racing for their start spots for the next day's Four, race. Three, two, one. Supported by the crowds in Schaffhausen, 31-year-old defending Tortor champion Nicole Rice got the prologue started, together with the only other female solo competitor, Hanka Ebertova. Rice, who has also won last year's Ultra Cycling Marathon World Championship, showed her skills and secured an easy prologue victory in the first place on the Tortora start line. In the men's solo race, last year's third-placed Marcus Amstutz was one of the favorites, and the 35-year-old from Switzerland posted a fast time on the one-kilometer-long polo course, underlining his ambitions for this year's race. 39-year-old Ralph Visvescu from Luxembourg was one of the other title contenders in the previous winner of the Tour du Mont Blanc. Also looked in good shape as he flew down the prologue course. At the end, he posted the fourth fastest prologue time in the fourth spot on the start line for the actual Tour Tour race.
Friedrich Dela from Switzerland also started the prologue in Schaffhausen with the goal of a podium place. The 34-year-old endurance athlete who set a new world record by covering more than 20,000 meters of altitude on foot in 24 hours looked sharp and finished the prologue in fifth place. As teams of two, four, or six made their way onto the one-kilometer course along the Rheinfall, the two female teams also tackled the prologue course. As Linda Spurig and Laura Strusso of the ladies' team showed their climbing skills and won the prologue in their category. In the mixed team category, Daniela Gudo and Kevin Beal of Team Scott on Tortura were all smiles at the start. 36-year-old Beal made the pace, racing ahead of his partner and arriving at the prologue finish line way ahead of Gudo. A 15-time Paralympic gold medalist, Heinz Fry is no stranger to endurance challenges, and the 57-year-old powered through the prologue course with his Zugvogel team members. Cheered on by the crowds, Fry once again showed that his disability doesn't stop him from living his dreams. Led by ultra-cycling legend Marko Balu from Slovenia, Team Loris Charity 4's main goal was to raise money for a charitable course. But with one of the most decorated ultra-cyclists at the helmet, it became clear during the prologue that the other Loris team members had their work cut out. Team Promotion Tools, last year's winner in the Team of Six category, were back at the Tortur as a four-man team and the passionate ultra-distance cyclists put down the pedal to the metal straight from the start, posting the second fastest prologue time in the Team of Four category. Team Samsung 6 with former road racer Urs Freula had team members with very different backgrounds, but like the other 700 cyclists that started this year's Tour Tour, they all gave it their best shot during the prologue and got themselves warmed up for the big one. With the prologue out of the way, now the 1,000-kilometer Tour Tour course awaited the field. The 1,000-kilometers start in a relaxed manner. We start here in Schaffhausen at 400 meters of altitude, and this year the route won't go past Lake Constance for the first time, but over the Togenberg into the Rhine Valley to Kerr. Then it continues into the pre-Alpine mountains like Sir Salva and across the first Alpine Pass, the Oberalp Pass, into Andermatt. After that, the two next passes, Grimsel and Furka, await and continue into the Berner Oberland, from where it goes via Jan Pass, and the Col de Moss into the Valis and to Lake Geneva. Then there's a new section, the Jura, which is a very demanding, outstanding, beautiful landscape with loads of climbs, which are very tough, especially if you aren't that fresh anymore. Then it's along the River Rhine via Basel, back here to Schaffhausen. The toughest stage will probably be the one with the Oberalp, Furka and Grimsel passes, where you've got 2,500 meters of climbing on a distance of 65 kilometers. That's where the rankings will be decided. You know who will be at the front and who will be in the back. I have been riding many races in the Alps in the last few years that had more climbs and more meters of climbing than here at the Tatur. But here with the distance, the Euro will be really tough because after 700, 800 kilometers in your legs, the finer climbs will definitely be hard. The descent down passes like the Grimsel is also a challenge because of the fast turns. The Col de Moss is an exhausting climb, and around Yvandon and saint croix there are some really demanding parts of the course. I think that the accents are crucial. You need to tackle them in the right way, and they need a lot of energy. If it's flat, you can get through easily. But then, of course, it's also a question of the weather conditions, and if the weather can make it possibly difficult. For us four, it's an advantage if it rains and there is thunder and lightning. That's when the mental aspects come into play, and if you target the whole thing with positive energy, that's where our strength lies. I always like it when the weather isn't that good, because I know that the others suffer more than me. Mm -hmm. 
think that's besonders. What's special about the tour tour is cycling at night because you don't normally do it. It's a really special feeling. You are alone. You have a different perception of speed and time. You see things that you don't see otherwise, and you especially hear things that you don't normally hear. So it really is something very special. The nature goes quieter and everything around you goes quiet, as there is hardly any traffic at that time. You are pretty much out there on your own, and that has always been a time that I've really enjoyed in training. On the other hand, there are dangers, but it's not the traffic as most people would expect, but rather wild animals. That's the biggest danger, or the fact that you get tired and won't see a pothole during the night. Cycling at night has many special aspects. With the good light, you can see ahead. But to your right and to your left, you don't see much if it's outside the light beam. So if you hear a noise from the side, you need to focus so you don't swerve. It really brings specific challenges, but it also has a certain charm. I like it, especially the quiet at night, but it also has its dangers, and you need to always be alert, especially on the descents. I guess a real danger are the wild animals that can run onto the roads. Perhaps it's dangerous, but I don't think about it because you might as well stop riding your bicycle. It's important not to think about the dangers, but positive things. I don't think it's actually dangerous. I feel I can focus better as there is no traffic at night and you have your peace and quiet to get into your rhythm. You really just have to listen to yourself. Cycling at night is no big deal if you have a good light. Of course, if it's going to rain, it won't be without dangers. But then it's better to lose a couple of minutes and look out for each other. And if you do that, then it will all work out. It was time to get the seventh Tortor on its way. And Nicole Rice, one of two solo women, was the first athlete to leave the IWC arena in Schaffhausen to start the 1,000 kilometer nonstop journey. One athlete after the next was off. And with the slightly cooler weather, the conditions were ideal. But then, disaster struck. Only 150 meters after the start of the team, Sug Vogel with Heinz Frey. I didn't pay attention and looked at my instruments, so I didn't look and I rode into the back of Heinz's bike. We won't lose or win the race right here, and I'm glad that he can carry on. Oh no! With the tube gone, Fry and his team members now had to wait for the support team. And after more than a half an hour and two tires installed on Fry's hand bike, Team Sub Vogel could finally fly off again into the night. Starting more or less at the same time as two other teams of four, the Swiss Promotion Tools team looked in good shape and ready for the first nighttime challenge. As team after team left Schaffhausen, mixed team Scott on Tortur also rode out into the night, followed shortly after by one of the charity teams, Laureus 4, with ultra-cycling legend Marco Balou making the pace up front. At dawn, the weather conditions deteriorated rapidly and the incoming rain made life difficult for all the cyclists. In the men's solo race, Luxembourg's Ralph Isvisku rode a lonely race at the front of the field, and the 39-year-old looked like he wasn't too bothered by the rain. Switzerland's Marcus Amstutz also had a good rhythm and raced in second place, looking to improve on his third place in the 2014 Tour. As Ralph Disvisku was approaching the first serious climb of the day, up to the Oberalp Pass, the weather had improved again and the 39-year-old from Luxembourg looked confident. Amstutz followed shortly after in second place and showed his climbing skills on the way up to the 2,046-meter-high Oberalp Pass, which connects the villages of Dissentis and Andermatt. 
the 35-year-old powered up the Serpentines and reached the top of the past as second fastest solo man. At this point in the race, Friedrich Dela was in fifth place, but the endurance specialist worked hard to close the gap to the athletes ahead of him to keep his podium dream alive. With the weather conditions turning once again, a lot of competitors opted for some warmer clothes, and as every year, the Tortora threw it all at the competitors. Bad weather, a relentless 1,000 kilometer course, and tough and long climbs. Once the Oberal Pass was out of the way, the even longer Furka Pass awaited the riders, and to reach the top of the pass at 2,429 meters, this really meant a long, tough climb. Despite the bad weather, Marcus Amstreet still looked positive and like all the other competitors, worked his way up to the top of the pass. In the women's race, 2014 Tortor champion Nicole Rice was riding a lonely race up front, and the 31-year-old from Winter Tour was on course to defend her title. But the weather conditions didn't make it easier for her, and the key was to conserve enough energy to make it all the way back to Schaffhausen. And one of the riders in the Masters category, Gary Hoffman from Germany, expressed exactly what most competitors were feeling. It was horrible all the way down the Oberall Pass. Torrential streams, it was cold, the handlebars were shaking, I had to change clothes straight away and now I've taken off the warming patch. Now only the Grimsel Pass is left and then we're almost halfway there. I believe every race has its ups and downs for every rider, but you have to always remember that the moment will come when it's going to get better and where it's going uphill again. Just remember that and then you can continue. You've got to fight your weaker self in most races, but on a long distance, it happens probably more often. People always ask, why do you do it? But if you just carry on and reach the finish line at the end, that's what drives me. You've got to pick yourself up all the time. After a three, four hour break, you need to be motivated to get back into your wet clothes. You also have to get warm again. And once you are warm again, the flow comes back. You can train as much as you like, but if you don't have the mental strength and the willingness to go over your limits, then it's better not to do it at all. As long as your head still functions and you can still push yourself, then you are okay. But when your head doesn't work anymore, then your body won't be able to go another meter. You need a sense of basic trust in your own body. So once you have reached the limit for five minutes, you know you can carry on and the horizon opens up again. I want to test the limits, and I also want to show what's possible for us wheelchair athletes. I want to give courage to others in general, but also for other disabled people. The body alone can't do it, and the mind alone can't do it either. It's the intersection between the two that makes it interesting to push the boundaries and to rise again once you've been through the low period. You have to train the mental side as much as the actual sport, and at the end of the day, it's more important to be mentally strong than physically fit, because if your head switches off, you're done. It's all about the mental strength, and if I tackle an endurance challenge like this, I don't say, I'll try it, but I'll do it and I'll finish it. It definitely helps to cycle through beautiful scenery, and when you raise your head once in a while and see beautiful mountains or catch a nice atmosphere, even at night when it's very atmospheric, then that definitely helps. When I'm on the road with my bicycle, I always try to enjoy the scenery and look on the left or the right. It helps you to forget that you're riding in a race, so I always take in the scenery.
On the ascents, you can look what you've got on your left or your right, and that's a good distraction from the excursions. But on the downhills, it's obviously not possible, because you need to be 100% focused. I really enjoy it, and on the ascents, you've got the time to look around. I believe it's part of it, and you should enjoy it as much as possible. You know you've got to take in these moments, so you keep those memories. For me, the scenery is really important. It really pushes me seeing those landscapes, even if it's only a colorful flower on the roadside. Those are the things you remember for a long time, the impressions and the views from the passes. As all the teams joined forces again to finish the last Totora stage together, the head-to-head -to -head race in the Team of Four category came to a conclusion when the Swiss Cha-Cha Cycling Team were the first cyclists to cross the finish line in Schaffhausen after 30 hours and 47 minutes. In second place, only 12 minutes behind the new Swiss Ultra Cycling Champions, the Schwitz Four Kids Team. Another 16 minutes behind in third place, the Promotion Tools team, who had to dig deep to finish this physically and mentally demanding non-stop race around Switzerland. At the moment, I can't quite describe how I feel. That's only possible after a while. Once you have processed all the impressions, it really was a constant up and down, but crossing the finish line just now was amazing. Hours later, the Audio Rent team also crossed the finish line in the four men category, followed shortly after by the Laureus TUI charity team and the six exhausted but delighted members of the Samsung 2 team. I think we've reached our goal. We've created new friendships, had no accidents, and we're proud of that. We just cycle, and there are lots of people around us whose support has been sensational. In the men's solo category, Ralph Disviscu stayed in control of the race and was untouchable all the way to the end. A year before entering the legendary race across America, the most legendary of all ultra cycling events, for the first time, Disviscu rode back into Schaffhausen with a smile and crossed the finish line after 36 hours. 51 minutes and 22 seconds. I'm overjoyed that I could win the most renowned ultra race in Europe, and possibly in the world. It's just great. This was my big goal this year, and now I have achieved it. I have worked hard for it, and I really am extremely happy. Marcus Amstutz also braved the tough weather conditions and everything else that was thrown at him, and after more than 37 hours in the saddle, the 35-year-old Swiss rider approached the finish line in Schaffhausen as official Swiss ultra cycling champion. Last year I was already the best Swiss rider, and this year I did it again. I trained for it, and it's unbelievable. I just can't believe it. Friedrich Dela, who was riding in third place for large parts of the Tortor, had an unfortunate crash only 20 kilometers before the finish line. In Luxembourg's Mark Leder profited from Dela's misfortune, claiming third place in the men's solo category. Team Scott on Tortor didn't manage to get on the podium in the mixed category, but was overjoyed to finish the race. The adrenaline is still pumping, and it's difficult to comprehend that we are standing here now. I mean, we just went all the way around Switzerland. After an emotional journey and almost 41 hours of hardship, the ladies' team made it back to Schaffhausen as Tortor winners. It really is special, but I can't quite believe it yet. I still need to comprehend it. But it's sensational. And when we arrived here, the tears were just flowing because of all the emotions. Knowing that we could win it really pushed us. After an astonishing solo effort and more than 46 hours in the saddle, Nicole Rice also made it back and defended her Tartor title. It's an incredible feeling, especially the reception I just received here. The whole race and organization were amazing, so yeah, I've got a lot of emotions and goosebumps. It's madness.